Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Lead. The Pillar 2 engine from PwC is a game changer for Pillar 2 modeling, provision, and compliance calculations. Built on a graph system utilizing over 20 years of international tax technology, this centralized rules engine is built by a team of Pillar 2 tax experts from around the globe. PwC's Pillar 2 engine is currently available as a service and is now available to license. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, we're in Madrid, Spain at the PwC Global Transfer Pricing Conference 2024, where I'm excited to have Chris Desmond back on the podcast. Chris is a Chicago-based transfer pricing partner turned customs and trade partner and the leader of PwC's U.S. Global Trade Services practice. Chris, welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> wow, this sounds like, you know, I'm here for transfer pricing, but you're here for customs. What's the deal? Yeah, and we're going to get there because I do want to understand this journey. Yeah, so we're right. together for a long we're time. To die. But before we go there, you know, I like to start with an icebreaker. Okay, there's been a lot of baseball talk here on the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. Yeah, which my international audience has very little interest in. But the last time I saw you, Chris, was last summer. So two summers ago, last baseball season, when my St. Louis Cardinals played your Chicago Cubs in London Stadium, it was an awesome experience. Split series, if I remember, I think we played two games. Yes, it was a very odd split series, too. Just so there's an odd moment in that Sangam game. And then we ended up, so this year, baseball, we ended up tied with the exact same record. The Milwaukee Brewers ended up winning. They're sort of now the the team at the top of the National League Central. Ten more games than us, but they didn't get very far this year. They did not get very far in the playoffs. But what? how would you assess your 2024 Cups, and what's your outlook for 2025? That was tough because we we obtained the um, the manager for the King of Brewers. Right. right? We're like high hopes, like, oh, man, that's the gear that we needed to kind of go to the next level. And it didn't really go to the next level. It kind of stayed the same. You know, you guys got our catcher and, and uh, we were trading some folks up. We got, got belly back in, but it was kind of like a, not a so great year. And it's just yeah. don't know what's going to happen. And and I hear the same thing for St. Louis. You guys might trade Contreras. You might keep or not keep Sonny Gray. I mean, there's just all these rumors yeah. going around. But the thing is though, both of us are not used to being in the position of looking up at the Brewers. Right. That's all I got to say. Yeah. That. No, it's it's a fair point. I, I will remind you know you that the manager actually doesn't play, um, and so I think does, there's a lot. No, does not. There's, there's a lot of attention that is put on like these managers, and certainly the Cardinals manager, yeah. given how bad we had this year. But you know, I I do like to remind people that like they're not the ones on the field actually play. I wish he did play a little bit. I, so he was good. like you know yeah. he had that funky stance I, now, I, but. I, I like it. But sorry, we don't need to do this whole podcast in baseball. That's that's my retirement plan. Okay, I'll, but I'll be talking for that. In <laughs> time, let's talk a little bit about customs and trade. Okay, and so maybe start with Chris. What do you do for a living? You've been on the podcast before. We yeah. talked about customs and trade, but maybe remind folks kind of what you were doing. And I mean, your your history and your past was as a transfer pricing partner, but I've been doing this customs and trade stuff for a number of years. And so, maybe just tell the listeners like, what do what do you do for a living? Oh, that's a, that's a neat question. So uh, my own career has been a transfer pricing practitioner, economist, um, working at different firms, was at PwC, actually had my own firm for a while, uh, did a lot of expert witness work as far as the prep teams and solutioning when different regs are coming out. I uh, came back to PwC, when was about eight years ago, Doug? And uh, during that time, right when I came back is we had tax reform. At the same time tax reform was happening, we didn't realize the other things that were happening uh, along with the Trump presidency at that time, dealing with tariffs. And so, you know, brought in tariffs. We were like, well, you know, these tariffs, yeah, sure, he's got to really follow through with them and putting tariffs on China goods up to 25%. They did go through. And as we know today, they haven't left. And so when that came in through, being a transfer pricing person, most of my career the customs group is really compliance. That's what they dealt with. But now all of a sudden you have a cost of sale that comes up to be 25% rise. That's material. And when that's material, it's like, how are you going to solution that? And so they said, hey, listen, you're a transfer pricing guy, but you understand how to solution bigger value chain types of operations. Can you work with the customs team and figure out what are the other solutioning we should do or think through 
And that's what they, I started doing. And you know what? I haven't stopped. Been doing that for seven years now and actually taking a deep dive into the customer's ranks and looking at the impact analysis because it's really fascinating when you look at something that my whole career is as a transfer price practitioner, when we do a structuring exercise with international tax, you'd say, well, we don't want to trip customs. Now, customs is leading the way because we're talking about things that sometimes involve refunds of the tens of millions of dollars of cash or solutioning costs that are very huge to a multinational because our customs teams are being asked by the C-suite, hey, what's the impact now? Whereas nobody talked to them about this stuff. They, they didn't have to go to the, to the board meeting. They didn't have to give reports to the CFO. Now they do. So let's so talk a little bit more about, you know, because Trump really changed the game during uh, his administration, you know, but when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came in, you know, talk a little bit more about that, about you know, the, what, what, what tariffs, what customs did he actually put on? And then, you know, we've also seen some from the Biden administration. And so maybe we'll start with the U.S. kind of sure. where are we today? And then, well, of course, we have to talk about the election here, which is a you know, less than a month away by the time we we publish this. Um, but uh, talk a little bit about sort of how we got here, and then we'll talk a little bit about where we may be going from a U.S. perspective. Yeah, from from a U.S. perspective, um, roughly speaking, we've got about three trillion dollars of U.S. imports a year, a little bit over that, depending on which year. And the imports that come from China, we're talking about over five hundred million. And the idea was is to have a pointed spear at China and have uh, the increased potential U.S. manufacturing or changing of supply chain. And that's when Trump went in and said, listen, I'm going to go and put in tariffs in place. They're going to be at different ranges, but most of them are going to be at like 25%. And 25% of country of origin, country of origin is key because it could pass through China. But if it's not country of origin, China doesn't get the tariff. And also China sells to another country like Taiwan or Mexico and it passes through. It's still country of origin, China. So that's why customs is very diligent upon importation to make sure that they understand where the country of origin is. Those tariffs came into play and they generated roughly, you know, 80, sometimes to $100 million of additional, um, hey, no, additional um, monies to the system. And I'm talking large amounts of money. Oh, yeah. And so when we talk about this, we're dealing with um, tariffs that are helping fund other initiatives to reduce taxation. So it's not just about tariffs and customs. It's also about um, how the overall plan was working out because it was going hand in hand with being able to reduce the corporate uh, corporate rate and having other inc incentives like FDII balanced with an inflow of uh, income from the tariffs. And it was a measure to say we want to have more companies focused on manufacturing in the U.S. or change your supply chain away from China. Fast forward to today. Mm -hmm. What's happened? The tariffs haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. The new Biden-Harris administration, they've had you know years of being in office, and they haven't changed the tariffs. In fact, you know, this past spring, they've decided to increase certain tariffs, and increasing tariffs for certain industries, certain products, primarily focused on China as well, over the next three years. So what does that tell us? Well, that's already in play. That's already happening, unless another administration comes in and changes that. But for a, a Biden and now potentially Harris administration, we don't see those tariffs necessarily going away. And they're actually going to be going up over the next three years. So from a multinational perspective, you know, not back in 2018, when we probably talked last time, might have been 2019. Mm -hmm. But when we talked, we talked about how those tariffs are probably going to go away, especially if the Democrats go in the office. Well, they did. They didn't go away. And now they're going up with the Democrats in office. So under a, let's say, a, a Harris administration, that's what we're seeing. But we haven't seen anything from Harris specifically on tariffs other than talking about why Trump's plans not so great. Mm -hmm. So, so could you, what are some of the details from the candidate Trump's proposals? Yes. So he's doubling down on tariffs. That, uh, that really helped fuel some things for him and the economy during this first two years. And he's taken to the next level and saying, we're going to increase the 25% uh, China tariffs up to 60% or more. Um, and then he said, we're going to also um, tariff all U.S. imports, regardless of location, of 10%. And that put shockwaves out there because that is a huge change. If we talk about the $3.2 trillion 
those numbers get really, really big when it comes to the additional amount of, of tariffs. And then he said, well, maybe I'll make it 20%. And that's what happened in August. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden you have a range of tariffs of, of 10 to 20% more on all products, regardless of country of origin. And then he went out and said, yeah, I would, uh, he's also going to make 100 to 200% tariffs on all autos from Mexico. So what is that telling us? Well, obviously the tariffs have been a big play for him. Um, when we do the numbers on this, this could potentially mean an additional $450 million to almost $720 million of income per year from a tariff regime just on the additional tariffs. This is not including what's already been out there. Mm -hmm. When we have that, that can also be used with tax policies too, right? But that's what that's what Trump's doing. And, and so what that means is companies, when you look at the numbers, if you're a company, you need to look at this and say, well, what does this mean to us? Because, I mean, right now, we don't know which candidate's going to win. You get changes every week. Um, we all have our own views, but we all have to be sensible about this from a business perspective because there's a chance that either candidate can get in there and one needs to think about, well, what are your options uh, with either? Because if you're, let's say, in the, in the C-suite and you're looking at a change, like we were doing the analysis for one company um, just uh, last week, Doug, and we were looking at what the potential impact could be under each administration with the potential 10 to 20 percent. We're talking 250 to, you know, through $500 million of additional costs for them. Wow. Okay. Think about those numbers for a sec. Yeah, and and so maybe I mean because the you know when you were here many years ago on the cross border tax stocks and there were these new um, tariffs that 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 we mentioned. How have you seen U.S. multinationals specifically's behavior change? And where I'm going and sort of from my vantage point, where obviously help advise clients from a supply chain perspective, it takes years to set up new manufacturing right. facilities and really fundamentally change a supply chain strategy, right? And we saw this with COVID and with the tariffs, and it was kind of this confluence of, of these unfortunate events for, for many industries. Um, but what is your kind of viewpoint sort of looking back at that, you know, 2018, those initial tariffs, and then also these proposed additional tariffs of companies really started to materially alter their supply chains, looking at where they're going to be doing manufacturing. And of course, there are other factors like pillar two incentives that, right. that need to be thought through. But talk a little bit about that, how customs and trade has played a role and what have you seen? We were expecting to see large lifts and shifts in supply chains, given how big the cost items are. Because if you think about it, these costs, what, what, are you going to absorb them? Or are you going to pass them on to your customer? Or you change your supply chain? So we were expecting that. We had one of our other um, partners in the firm did a study on how many companies did change their supply chain and put it out this, um, this summer. And when you look at that, there weren't many changes because of what you said. It's really hard, especially for companies invested in the manufacturing location right. in China. You're not going to shift that really quick. Right. I mean, you've already invested your capital in there. That's a huge cost item. If you do the cost benefit analysis, you can do the math on it over a round rate of how many years people are planning to say at that time, how many years are you going to have where this administration's in with tariffs? Now we've had eight years of tariffs. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to go any way. So now with the talk about increased tariffs, uh, I think companies are going to have to think about alternatives. The problem is, though, if Canada Trump gets in, and you still get tariffed regardless country of origin, that's going to be a challenge for some, some companies. And what we did see, though, is we did see some companies do the actual change of the supplies to, let's say, Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mexico had an uplift in production. And when they do enough, let's say, uh, transformation into the product, they can change the what's called the HTS code in which then the tariff is not applied because they change the country of origin. So Mexico is often known as a place where you'll do manufacturing at, and you might have parts and components coming in to Mexico, right? But as long as they then change the country of origin when they come together, then they go under USMCA and then they're fine. Yeah, and I think that from, from a practical perspective, many of these large multinationals that are really large, big, you know, have big impacts from this, 
they have manufacturing locations all over the world. You know? And so they can then, instead of setting up a new manufacturing plants or look to Mexico now to source the U.S. as opposed to China, for example, yeah, maybe a more cost efficient or practical solution to, to some of those issues. But sometimes like that's 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 not possible. Um, I want to stay in North America, okay. um, you know, because we're at our global transfer pricing because I want to want to cover sure. some other areas outside the U.S., uh, but these are very have a huge impact on the U.S. and and that's Canada and and Mexico, and they both recently enacted some import tariffs on steel and aluminum products. Talk a little bit about about that. Yeah, and even other products in the in the semiconductor space too when it comes to our equipment. And what? Take a step back. Why? Why is this happening? Well, they're getting pressured by the U.S. They know that many um, companies and other countries have decided to circumvent the trade routes and go through either Canada or to Mexico in order to get the actual products imported in the U.S. So the pressure has been put out there to say, well, we want you to also now tariff goods coming particularly from China. The U.S. is putting pressure on that's right. That's right. And so we want you to implement your own tariffs so that you know, China cannot circumvent the products that are coming into the U.S. even indirectly when it comes to being manufactured in Mexico. And I went through both Canada and Mexico uh, this summer, introduced their own tariffs to non-favored nations and countries and, and dealing with uh, the imposition of, you know, five to 50 percent tariffs on, let's say, China origin goods. So what does this mean? When a company then is thinking about their supply chain and they have parts and components coming from China into Mexico, into their contract manufacturing, Maquila operation, and then coming to the U.S., they are potentially going to be tariffed at 5 to 50 percent. But they're thinking, oh, we'll change the country of origin. Well, perhaps. But then Mexico came out with a change of what's called Rule 8. And the Rule 8 exemption they used to have is they'd be able to pass through and then change where you wouldn't have to be tariffed. Well, that's been taken away. So now the burden of proof is going to be on Mexico that the product has actually been exported to the U.S. So take an example of you know dealing with a semiconductor chip or a you know an auto company. All the parts and components that come from China into Mexico being manufactured in the vehicle. Now you have what's called a bill of materials bomb. That's going to be then shipped. The car is going to be shipped to the U.S. Mexico has to prove each part of where it came from and apply the tariff and pay it upon exportation into the U.S. That exercise is going to be very laborious, sure. very time-consuming, and costly. But now we're dealing with 5 to 50% tariffs unless they can prove that has been exported to the U.S. So now there's going to be a new documentation type of exercise that's going to be done for U.S. multinationals who are using Mexico operations to do their manufacturing which they don't sole source everything. So these are some of the new things that are going to have to be done in order to mitigate these costs on tariffs, but also ensure that, and the reason why the push was for these tariffs, so that those parts are not coming through and just disappearing without there being any accountability. So so let me just run this back. This I know that's a lot. This is fascinating. Free. Yeah, this is fascinating. So because, I mean, imagine there's all these, let, let's use an automobile because yeah. I have a lot better understanding. You have a lot of autos or no? <laughs> no, but okay. I, I have a auto. Okay. And I do have a better understanding of the components of an automobile than I do of a sure. semiconductor chip, for example. But as different pieces for that automobile come in from China, yeah. that that to the extent that those those pieces have not, I guess, been materially altered or changed, there will need to be a tariff placed on that those components. So let's say the car stereo, for example, right. that was coming sure. from, now that gets installed and included into the vehicle, but I'm guessing that that component part, because it's from China, would still be subject to that tariff. Um, and yeah, and, unless then you change the country of origin. But part of the issue is, is that if you think about USMCA, and there's percentages in there, so the percentages are set up where companies are really looking to make sure that the parts and, and, and how much is done in Mexico I see. as a certain percent. But now all of a sudden you have to add an additional cost for tariff amounts of those materials that weren't there before. That's going to probably change those percentages and people are not necessarily thinking about that. Got it. So you had mentioned um, as Wooly, and I think yeah. this is, and you had also mentioned this, this Maquiladora um, concept. Yeah. What is the what is 
generally this this maquiladora concept that Mexico has established, and you know it's really an incentive to encourage manufacturing exactly um, in Mexico. But many U.S. multinationals um, have, have been, and it's not just unique to U.S. multinationals. Frankly, we're seeing OMC more interest from both you know Asia invest investors, Asia multinationals, and European multinationals. But talk a little bit about this maquiladora regime. Yeah, I mean, this has been around for, gosh, my whole career. Yeah, it's time. been very favorable for U.S. multinationals that are looking to have manufacturing done in a very, you know, cost-based that allows them to either ship their own parts and components down to Mexico, have them assembled and come back, and where the U.S. then has, you know, tax-favored type of operations with those transactions coming back. And it's been very interesting for transfer pricing and how you use them, but it's been a great, great way to increase, to have lower costs for manufacturing, but also having the tax favored impact of having the kilo structure and having it done where labor's you know, a lot cheaper at that time. And when you come back in, you know, you're gonna be better off than what you do if you manufactured in the US. So it's been great to have that. However, now that's gonna be in question. Now you have to think about all the cost elements of the Mexico tariffs, because they're gonna be blind to any maquila structure. It doesn't matter. Customs is saying you actually have parts that cross the border, let's say from the U.S. to Mexico to be assembled and coming back. That part, that that finished product coming back, no special treatment. That is going to be an export from Mexico to the U.S. And it's under now the rules that we have for what's going on with Rule Eight, what's going on with the um, New Mexico tariffs, and also the U.S. tariffs. So that's going to Probably either if the companies haven't thought about that, you have to put a pause on that and think about what our calculation is going to be. So what what I feel is the most important thing, Doug, is that what we typically talk about in these meetings, modeled. It comes down to modeling because we have to look at the modeling and these rules are not easy. That's going through with these rules with our team in Mexico and, and how the calculations need to be made and the details behind using your car example, yeah. using a bill of material and tracing the components and then the country of origin for each piece so that you can then do the calculation of what gets tariffed and what doesn't, what then goes into the USMCA calculation and then ultimately the export from Mexico to the US and then how does the US tariff the ultimate finished product of the new HTS. There's a lot there. There's a, and it's more than customs. There's, it's going to impact a lot of different oh, yeah. areas. I mean, and the, just the way I, Chris, think about the, the, Maquila, the Maquiladora regime, um, and more, more, maybe from a tax perspective, is that it effectively allows the U.S. or whoever to be a principal and sort right. of treats Mexico almost as a toll manufacturer. Yes. So I mean by that, that. Well, generally, the raw materials are owned by the principles of both, most often the U.S. Um, the finished goods, the, the even the manufacturing equipment is all owned by the principal by the U.S. company. And so that there is sort of less uh, roles, responsibilities, value activities in Mexico to be subject to tax in Mexico. So that's a, it's just a smaller piece of the pie that Mexico is subject to tax. And then that residual income is in the U.S. and obviously subject to tax in the U.S. or some other jurisdiction, wherever the, the principal is. Um, but it has provided, and then from a customs and duty perspective, I, my understanding was you know, historically before some of these changes, yep. right, it allowed taxpayers, companies to be able to move stuff back and forth more efficiently between Mexico and, and the U.S., um, and now with these changes in the customs, I think there's also the big change, which is pillar two, yep. right? And that because that income is may not be subject to tax or is, not to dis, is a, subject to a small amount of tax in Mexico, um, depending on how it is structured in the U.S. and whether it can qualify as FDI, for example, or as foreign source income, it could potentially dilute the rate of pillar two tax in the U.S. And so... You know, pillar two has a has a, a, a plays a factor in that, and then obviously the customs and trade, I think, plays a, a very big factor. Absolutely, and that's why I, I think that you 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 obviously described it how in my former career as a transfer price right. person, I would think about it. But I've already switched to the customs uh, side, and thinking it. about the actual tangible property transactions, what has to do for these calculations. But you're spot on, and and that's where. I think the advantages of that, you're going to have to like think for a moment and say, are they going to still be there depending upon the actual what's being applied now in actual new rules in Mexico 
combined with the unknown of which administration is going to be taking over office. So you know, one of the big trends that we're seeing, it just, I want to say in the international tax, but it's beyond tax because tax feels like it's limited, doesn't include tariffs and customs and, and trade, is just the sheer amount of data that is needed for compliance. Right? Yes. We talked a lot about this on the podcast with Pillar 2, um, but that's got to be a big challenge for taxpayers as well. And just the example that you're giving in Mexico and to be able to unpack all of this uh, are taxpayers ready? Do they have the data? Do they have the systems to be able to even comply with these with these changes? Uh, I think I would be very surprised if very many companies can say yes to that question. And the reason being is that the amounts of data we're talking about, it's not one data source, Doug. It's yeah. multiple. So even in the U.S., we have, you know, companies have their own ERP data. Then they also have, you know, the the ACE portal, which is the U.S. Customs database, which is kind of a mirror image of the data of the imports and exports of the U.S. multinational. And then they also have brokers and forwarders they work with. They have more data points, and sometimes they have the data points of country of origin, proof of export. Well, companies usually need to kind of bring these together, right? And that's not an exercise a lot of companies are really accustomed to doing. Nor do they even think about doing that. And that's just the U.S. Yeah. Now imagine doing this in Mexico now, because no different from the U.S., Mexico also has a customs database, but it's organized differently, different protocols to get the data, different information you can get, but you need to marry the stuff together in order to do the compliance aspect of it. Same thing goes with Canada. So Canada's actually got a new custom database that's going to be released, I think it's the end of October. And what's going to be about this is going to be digital, because they used to be non-digital and you had to do things uh, more archaically. But okay. they're getting there. They're good things. Okay. And, and as, as you mentioned earlier, they also have implemented tariffs as well uh, from, you know, uh, up to, I think, 50% as well for imports into Canada from locations like China. The twist of this is that there's also this thing in DST. I don't know if you've uh, been paying attention you know, to DST. Yeah, digital service taxes. But with DST, um, if you go back to why we have the Trump tariffs in place, the 301s. Sorry if I'm hitting my microphone, but I just was, I was very passionate about my statement coming up. Um, the 301s are used to um, protect the U.S. for unfair trade or trade prior practices. Well, because of the digital service taxation that's happening, um, Canada is one of the countries that has said that they're going to um, implement DST, which means that the U.S. will then, a lot of the companies that were dealing with the U.S., like your Googles and your Amazons, are potentially going to pay a DST to Canada. And the U.S. has already said, well, if that happens, um, we're going to implement a retaliatory tariffs just for DSTs as well. We'll do that for any other location that implements a DST. And it, it's, it's industry agnostic, which means that it doesn't have to be your Amazon and Googles of the world. It's all product. Right. So we're over in Europe. We're thinking about we're in Spain right now. So think about all the Spanish wines that are here and that get shipped to the U.S. And they don't get shipped with necessarily a tariff. Well, what if we have DSTs in, 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 in Spain? You know, France has also been talked about because I know that they're very worried about that. And the French winemakers are concerned. We have companies that are having shipments of wine set now ahead of potential tariffs or DST retaliatory measures uh, from the U.S. side if the U.S. filed us through on this. So there's some crazy things going on. And, and the tariffs overall, I would say, are being used as a... A geopolitical retaliatory measure, measure right. uh, for lots of things that don't necessarily align with the exact trade. Right. But that's a way to enforce a view. Yeah, it's the sword. It and is the sword. They're using, that the policymakers are, are using. And just to remind listeners, the proliferation of these digital service taxes is really a consequence of amount A from pillar one really on life support. And I, you know, I've i said this a number of times on the Crossborder Tax Talks podcast, without the U.S. on board with Amount A, it is not going anywhere. And the U.S. is not on board with, with Amount A. So consequently, we're going to see more jurisdictions like Canada impose digital service taxes because Amount A is not going anywhere. Right. And you know, to your point, we've got it in Canada, in Europe, you know, I think we're just at the very beginning stages now where 
think Europe may be a little bit slower to accept that amount A is, is, is not going anywhere. And if we start seeing more DSTs, more of these digital service taxes, the question is what type of retaliatory efforts do, do we see? The other retaliatory effort, Chris, that I can foresee looking at my crystal ball is once this under tax profit rule kicks in in 2025. So right now for pillar two, we have you know 35, roughly 35 countries that we see the will be up to 40 that are going to be implementing pillar two. Most of those uh, countries that are implementing in, in 2024 have their under tax profit rule that'll kick in in 2025. Now, the U.S. was able to negotiate sort of this, this safe harbor for the under tax profit rule, at least through 2025 or through 2026. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if that expires and subsidiaries of the U.S. start to try to collect the top up tax of the U.S. as a result of their R&D credits or other Inflation Reduction Act potential credits. Um, I, I believe that customs and tariffs could be another retaliatory you know, measure that the U.S. would take against the UTP all. Yep. Um, and so sort of to your point that these are kind of tax related, but that, that it, it, it has become the sword now from a policymaker's perspective to, to combat, you know, some of these other rules that they may not like, like digital service taxes or the under tax profit. It is spot on. And, and I think what's going to be really interesting is hopefully we don't get in that situation. But if we do, we get an administration that they start doing tariffs in the U.S. to multiple locations worldwide. It's not going to stop there. We're going to see retaliatory measures in Europe to U.S. exports. We're going to see retaliatory measures um, from Asia for the same thing. It's 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 going to be like a war on tariffs a bit if this happens, which I hope doesn't. Uh, I don't think that's good for the global economy, but it's it's being used at least for posturing negotiation tactics. Yeah, uh, sure. And, and especially for even the conversation of DS2. Yeah, your point is a good one. And that the U.S. isn't the only one that uses that. Like they take out their sword. Well, the other country yeah. then, even though they are the ones that have opposed the DST, for example, or the under tax profit rule, they can then react, right, for, for, with, their, with their own tariffs for U.S. Or, or other goods. And I think the U.S. largely is going to be in the center of that. If my crystal ball is clear, which it always it's not always fair. Is. I agree with you in your crystal ball. Uh, yeah. uh, but we will see. So we talked a little bit about Europe and the proliferation yeah. of DSTs. What about Asia? Any trends that 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 we are seeing in, in in Asia from a customs and trade perspective? Yeah, and and what's what's interesting since we're at the global transfer pricing conference, and and as a transfer pricing practitioner, my whole career, everything came down to data. And everybody's always talked about the difference between customs and and uh, and transfer pricing values. Well, we're actually seeing that in Asia, where uh, transfer pricing is being used, the reports and the prices to say, well, how come that's not being reflected in what's for customs? So customs authorities are now using transfer pricing reports in that direction. To me, in the age we're at, Doug, and with the age of AI and the companies and firms and uh, government agencies investing in AI, it's not going to be too far away where it's going to go the other way as well, or if it hasn't, it will be soon. Mm -hmm. And you think about these large, vast databases, and you talked about the challenge of companies having to do these calculations and how you're going to do the tariff calculations, or especially with the Mexico example. What if all this data became easy, right? And it all became into a repository, even for a particular country, being able to then pit the customs data against transfer pricing and vice versa easily amongst the administration. What is that going to do? Well, there's going to be a lot more. Audits. Oh, yeah. There's going to be a ton more audits. And now it's going to be important to get your story in place because we all know that the customs value that's, it shouldn't necessarily equal the transfer pricing value, but you need to make sure you memorialize why. Mm -hmm. What are the differences in valuation? Why is it appropriate? What are the comparables used? The different methods that we have in customs and in transfer pricing to then bridge the positions that are being taken for a particular location and making sure you also can then maybe equate that to your system-wide profits too. Because that's something as a transfer pricing practitioner, a lot of times you have to default to when you're going into one particular jurisdiction and looking at challenges, what's well, not just about the profits that you make in this one jurisdiction, but what is their piece of the pie to the world pie mm -hmm. 
of the company, system-wide profits, and why does that also make sense? Yeah, and you can imagine the taxing authorities, obviously, you know, they have the customs information you mentioned earlier, Canada, and, and as an example, getting more sophisticated, it sounds like, yep. digitizing their process. As I think about Pillar 2, for example, this globe information return, which generally requires 300 data points um, for per you for the actual file this return. Many companies are going to be relying on the transitional safe harbor rules for Pillar 2, which requires a country-by-country -country report, a qualifying country-by-country -country report. That is going to be data that needs to be shared amongst taxing authorities, um, and potentially multiple taxing authorities. And there's a lot of questions with respect to how Pillar 2, how this is going to work among sharing some of this data. But it doesn't feel like, Chris, that we're that far away from a situation where, you know, global globally, governments and taxing authorities have access to just cross-border data and information. Yes. To your point, being able to now cross-reference that between customs data, between what they're finding in the local income tax returns, yep. what they're seeing from a Pillar 2 perspective. Now, to remind folks, all of those are some different rules, different tax bases, right. including Pillar 2 and the actual corporate income taxes. But it's just a lot of data for taxing authorities, tax administrators, right, and auditors to be able to go through. And then you start to think about AI and other ways to sort of digitally enhance that process. And there will potentially be a lot more screen. Doug, that day is coming. That, that's going to happen. And in fact, that, I mean, you can see how it happens. And when we think about it, even our own businesses and how you actually take data and data becomes easier. Well, when data becomes easier, then you're able to hone in on the potential issues and opportunities. Well, if all of a sudden different government agencies are able to do that as well, that's going to happen with data. And so you just need to take a step ahead and say, well, what's going to be the store? All right. So maybe here to close things out, Chris, what, what do you, any words of wisdom you have folks from large multinationals? I mean, yeah. we've got an election that's right around the corner. Um, some of this, obviously, I mean, just uncertainty is just something that all of us as global business people have to deal with. But you know, what advice do you give to, to taxpayers as they think about the customs landscape, given all the uncertainty we have? And you know, how do companies make long? Because what companies need this certainty to make long-term investment decisions, you know, wh how do you help them through that? I think it really involves the part we mentioned earlier about modeling, because you need to have the modeling done on the what ifs, but also what is coming. So we talked about you know, the, the, the Biden-Harris tariffs in the U.S. You need to model that because that's over the three, next three years. Mm -hmm. You need to model out what the impacts of the Mexican tariffs and Rule 8 are to your current transactions today. What's happening in Canada? Same thing. And then the rest of the world. Because we talked about a lot of different things. Different things are happening related to a talent tariffs. You take this model and then you say, okay, and then who wins the office in the U.S.? It's going to be Harris, Trump. And then understand how that pivots your modeling. Now, all we have is the data points. Now it's time to get your customs people, your transfer pricing, international tax, supply chain people in the room. Look at this data and say, what does this mean for us? And what do we need to do? Yeah. And I'm going to double down on that last point. And, and again, like my, my, my frame of reference is so much of this pillar two. But bringing in this a group of, of experts that maybe have not spent a lot of time talking to each other in the past, right? right. Particularly in the, the transfer pricing and the customs, you know, one's above the line, one's below the line. Right. And so there are different teams that That's work right. on this stuff. And again, we're seeing it with Pillar 2, just the, the data that is needed and working with the, the systems people that really have not had a lot, maybe a lot of experience with tax and they're asking all these questions like, why do you need this information? But Getting these people in a room together virtually or physically and having these conversations, I think is just a really big change in tax that I've seen really over the course of the last five, 10 years that it really requires some multiple uh, experts and data and between lawyers, accountants, customs, trade people, whatever. And it's really making sure that you've got the right people at the table and that thinking through, to your point, multiple different scenarios, risk assessing those, and then trying to, to make the best informed decision. 100%. That is absolutely needed because if you don't do that, if you just go and have the customs team run the numbers and go with that, 
you're missing potentially the bigger impacts. All right. Well, Chris, always a pleasure. I love this. is a fascinating topic. And I think it's going to just be a, a play a bigger and bigger role in cross-border transactions. Uh, and then we'll keep an eye on it and bring you back to, to talk more about it on the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast. Thank you, that, Chris. I hope our teams are doing better then. Hopefully, yes. Maybe at some point we can, uh, we'll make, both be in the playoffs, but. There we go. Deal. Uh, I'm, not, Deal. So I'm not counting on that for next year, Chris, but we'll see. So. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Chris Desmond, Customs and Trade Partner at PwC. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Lead. Stay tuned for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.